Welcome aboard applicants. I thought I'd begin with the first year law students exam, October 2009, question number two. So let's let's begin with, as with all essay questions, let's begin with the call of the question. What crimes, if any, might Donald, Brenda, and Cor Cork, uh, Corky reasonably be charged with, and what defenses, if any, might each assert? Well, we already know our area of law here. It's going to be criminal law. Okay, first of all, let's uh, highlight that. So, okay, now coming down here, crimes and defenses of Donald, question mark, crimes and defenses of Brenda, question mark, and crimes and defenses of Corky. Make sure to put state v. Donald, state v. Brenda, and question mark here, and then state v. Corky. Okay. And under each of these, since we know the area of law, let's put our shopping list. Murder, structure, or I should say this, let me do it this way. Murder, structure, theft, crimes against the person, solicitation, conspiracy, attempt, and defenses. Copy and paste that below. Excellent, for each one of these, okay. All righty, let's start reading our, our question. Actually, let's pull, put this to the second page so we can all see see at once here. Okay, great. Okay, let's start reading our question for a bird's eye overview perspective. Vladimir owned Donald, owed Donald a gambling debt. Knowing that Vladimir had a new laptop computer, Donald sent an email to Brenda who lived close to Vladimir. The email informed Brenda that Donald had left his laptop at the home of Vladimir, who was away for the weekend, but that Vladimir had given Donald permission to re re retrieve his laptop while Vladimir was gone. In the email, Donald asked Brenda to go to Vladimir's house, locate the, the, door, uh, the door key under the mat on the porch, and bring the laptop to Donald. Corky, who was at Brenda's house when Donald sent the email to her, read the email and rushed over to Vladimir's house to steal the laptop. When Vladimir or when when Brenda later arrived at Vladimir's house to retrieve the laptop for Donald, she found the back door open and Corky ransacking the house. Corky was so startled that she fell backwards, hit uh, hit his head on a table and lost consciousness as he fell to the floor. Brenda went upstairs where she searched for and found the laptop. Always wanting a laptop, she put Vladimir's laptop in her purse to keep for herself. Brenda then called 911. Before the police arrived, Corky regained consciousness conscious, and fled uh, out, of the, out, out the back door. When the police arrived at Vladimir's house, Brenda told them that she believed Corky had taken a laptop from the house. When the police went to Corky's house, they found him... Uh, dead from his head injury. Now, right here, we're dealing with, in terms of the Donald email, right here, what would that be originally classified, or what, what would we say that that is? That would technically be from Donald to be solicitation. So let, let's put that right underneath Donald now. Make sure to put in merger. And as with solicitation, we're seeing if there is a, a conspiracy. Solicitation being that we're dealing with the email that was sent to Brenda. Okay. Merger is uh, if there's an agreement, the solicitation merged with the conspiracy, but the conspiracy does not merge with the target crime. Okay. Now coming back up here. 
the email informed Brenda that Donald had left his his laptop at the home of Vladimir, who was away for the weekend. Well, this the stuff the knowledge that Donald had too. We want to make sure to bring this out. He'd be an accomplice liability because he had he aided and abetted with the knowledge, aided and abetted in the commission of the crime with the intent that the crime be committed. Um, the conspiracy conspiracy charge. So we want to make sure to bring out that we have what we look for agreement. Overt act, target crime, and make sure to bring out co conspiratorial liability. Which we call as the Pinkerton's rule. Now do we, okay, after having established that, and let's see, I think that's, okay, yeah. Now, what about, okay, now here we have we have the email informing Brenda that, that Donald had left, okay, okay, the email informed Brenda that Donald had left his laptop at the home of Vladimir, who was away for the weekend, but that Vladimir had given Donald permission to retrieve his laptop while Donald, while, sorry, while Vladimir was away, or was gone. In the email, Donald asked Brenda to go to Vladimir's house, locate the door key under the mat on the porch, and bring the laptop to Donald. So, talking about Brenda here, when Brenda got got that laptop, or I should say the the email concerning the laptop, I want to make sure to throw in a conspiracy here. So this is the aspect about uh, a, was there an agreement? That was that's the part here and there might have been an overt act in furtherance and we, there might uh, there was target crime situation going on here and we also look to again uh, co-conspiratorial liability Pinkerton's rule okay and we want to make sure too that we look for okay up here now that, let, actually, let's let's continue in the email, Donald asked Brenda to go to Vladimir's house. Look, at, we already talked about that. Now, Corky, who was at Brenda's house uh, when Donald sent the email to her, read the email and rushed over to Vladimir's house to steal the laptop. Okay, this is Corky down here. Make sure that we have a conspiracy. And that, again, I'll copy and paste all of our stuff here. Down here. Okay. Okay. Now, what hap Now, what happens now is okay for Corky, who was at Brenda's house when Donald sent the email to her, read the email, rushed over to Vladimir's house to steal the laptop. Okay. When Brenda later arrived at Vladimir's house to retrieve the laptop for Donald, she found the back door op well open, and Corky ransacking the house. Now, at this point, you know, I would say too that see, Brenda was given information by Donald that in, incorrect information by Donald that, or should I say this? Excuse me. That yeah, because there was Vladimir had owed Donald a gambling debt, knowing that knowing that Vladimir had a new laptop. Donald sent an email to Brenda. Now, this aspect too, who lived the who who lived close to the Vladimir. I want to make sure to point this out as well that. We have we have a the the larceny the target crime here would would be technically the the larceny. Okay, make sure to bring that out. Okay, now up here though, right here. Uh, okay, uh, we we can okay. Donald sent an email to Brenda who who lived close to Vladimir. The email informed Brenda that Donald had left his laptop at which is a which is a incorrect piece of information at, at, uh, at the home of Vladimir who was away for the weekend okay so we argue down here that that Brenda the argument could be made when she, did she um, was she working from in terms of the conspiracy um, information that would in terms of an intent she did not have a criminal criminal intent to to steal and I would say yes on that because so I would say that um, mistake factual mistake or right off the bat here okay 
because she didn't she didn't uh, understand and I want to possibly put down here that we have um, an innocent in it well innocent agent um, question mark on that one okay up here now uh, th this is when Corky who was at Brenda's house when Donald sent the email to her read the email and rushed over to Vladimir's house to steal the laptop when Brenda uh, later arrived at Vladimir's house to retrieve the laptop for Donald she found the back door open and Corky ransacking the house so we got now Cork um, so we, she found the back door open okay so Corky I want to make sure here that we throw in an additional crime for Corky here as well. Not only do we have, I was going to say burglary at least, okay. I want to make sure to talk about common law in that instance and modern law. Okay, up here. Okay, um, okay. Corky was so startled that he fell backwards, hit his head on the, on the table, lost consciousness as he fell to the floor. Uh, Brenda went upstairs. Uh, Brenda went upstairs where she searched for and found the laptop. Always wanting a laptop, she put Vladimir's laptop in her purse to keep for herself. Okay, at this point, okay, this is where Brenda commits a larceny. Um, taking of laptop. Okay. Now this, the aspect up here concerning the uh, the information that she was given by Donald that the laptop was um, actually was actually Donald's, but in fact it was Vladimir's. So that 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 information would possibly defeat the the con the original conspiracy, and I want to put that put these arguments up here. Okay. Okay. Now the larceny though, the taking of the laptop at the point that she always wanted that laptop, so she put the laptop in her purse to keep for herself. We have a larceny at that point for, for Brenda. Now Brenda then called 911 and even so therefore even if this situation down here, right here, I want to make sure to point this out that after the larceny, just taking this in a chronological order, we have a possible withdrawal situation. That in the event in the event that we may have, may find a conspiracy, we want to make sure that we talk about um, the the two the two arguments in terms of the law split that that the withdrawal argument for as a defense that Brenda can make, and that is common law where renunciation and modern law renunciation plus the thwarting of the crime or or pro or no notification of prop notification to, to the uh, proper authorities concerning the crime this calling the 911 might might uh, might be enough for that now before the police arrived Corky regained conscious conscious and fled out the back door now back here the startling when Corky was so startled that he fell backwards this bat aspect down here we want to make sure to point this out underneath this argument here that we may have we may have the murder of Corky. We'll we'll take take a look at that here in the next paragraph. Now when the police arrived at Vladimir's house, Brenda told them that she believed uh, Corky had taken a laptop from the house. Now what is this information here? This would be um, I you know I see that okay this is further uh, supporting facts for our the the homicide. So when the when the police went to Corky's house, they found him dead from his head injury. Okay, so right right here, we want to make sure that we're all the information that we use or that lead led up to this led led up to they found uh, dead from his head head injury. Corky being dead from his head injury, we want to make sure to point that out. All the facts being used before that as part of this. Okay, murder of Corky. We throw in I should say this. Let me throw in um, homicide of Corky. We have uh, homicide. We have actual cause. We want to make sure too. We throw in a year and a day rule. Um, actual cause, but for test, proximate cause.
and it's in inside of the uh, proximate cause that we're going to talk about that if if um, if actually wait a minute let me let me hold off on that discussion we're going to talk about the murder and malice of forethought right here and we was there okay first of all was there in intent to kill I don't, I don't see that how about felony murder rule when this is where we have the 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 death of a co-felon during the commission of a felony and this is where we're talking about here when Brenda put put the laptop in her purse she what was that after now here's here's the argument okay Brenda went to went went to Vladimir's house uh, upon learning all this information about from Donald now let me re reread this up here to, to make sure my my understanding is correct. Now, Vladimir owned Donald a owed Donald a gambling debt, knowing that Vladimir had a new laptop computer. Donald sent an email to Brenda, who lived close to Vladimir. The email informed Brenda that Donald had left his laptop at the home of Vladimir, who was away for the weekend, but that Vladimir had given Donald permission to retrieve his laptop while Vladimir was gone. In the email, now this okay. Okay, down here, I want to make sure that I'm glad we pointed this out. I don't know if it's a fa factual mistake, but the defense of retaking own chattel. Okay, right there. Um, okay, to retrieve his laptop while Vladimir was gone. In the email, Donald asked Brenda to go to Vladimir's house, locate the the door key under the mat, under the uh, mat on the porch, and bring the laptop to Donald. Now, this is where Corky, who was at Brenda's house, okay. So, we have at this point Brenda, who does only is operate operating under the the lack of criminal intent, going over to Vladimir's house and retrieving the retrieving the laptop. So now Corky, who was at Brenda's house when Donald sent the email to her, read the email and rushed over to Vladimir's house to steal the laptop. Now when Brenda later arrived at Vladimir's house, uh, and that, see this is the difference between the two right here. You have Corky who's reading the reading the reading the email and then forming the criminal intent where you have the the initial aspect of Brenda who is basically um, helping Donald retrieve his laptop from from Vladimir? And now, when when Brenda or later arrived at Vladimir's house to retrieve the laptop for Donald, she found the back door open, and Corky ransacking the house. Now, Corky, who was so startled, this is the aspect about the homicide, um, that he fell backwards, hit the hit his head on a table, and lost conscious on, as he fell to the floor. Now. Here's the here's the thing about this. Brenda was upstairs where she searched for and found the laptop. Always wanting a laptop, she put Vladimir's laptop in her purse to keep for herself. There's there's a larceny for Brenda. Brenda then called 911. This is the aspect about about the um, possible withdrawal defense. Before the police arrived, Corky regained conscious and fled out the back door. Now, when the police arrived at Vladimir's house. Brenda told them that she believed Corky had taken a laptop from the house. When the police, um, when the police went to Corky's house, they found him dead from his from his head injuries. So, now this is a really interesting aspect here because we have Brent, uh, to actually State State v. Donald here. I think we could argue that we have felony murder for for Donald here for the for the death of of Corky. Okay, and now also here, running through our, no, are we, are we taking care of murder? Yes. Uh, structure crimes, that would be take, taken up under the Pinkerton's rule. Theft crimes, we, are, we talked about that, the accomplice liability, and then now the, the larceny is the target crime here, so we want to point out larceny here. And then, okay, now crime, we don't have, we don't have a crime against the person. Alright, talking about solicitation. Was there any any attempted crimes? I don't 
I don't see that. Okay, and then and then defenses here. So for Donald, we have solicitation, merger, conspiracy, accomplice liability, the possible larceny discussion, and then felony murder. Throwing a, throwing in a conclusion at this point. Okay, now Brenda, down here we have the we have was there was there a uh, the homicide of Corky? And that's what we're looking at. Um, yes, we we we're going to be discussing that. The how about the uh, structure crimes? Well, see, did, did, um, oh, you know what? Ooh, I, I can see where there is a, um, a sneaky little issue here for burglary. Okay. Okay, I'm going to throw, throw that one in. And then, then there's a uh, structure, then theft. We talked about that. That was the larceny, crime against the person. Now the crime against the person that was uh, I don't see it as oh may, maybe assault maybe I'm seeing here the assault of Corky because Corky was startled that's the only thing I could think of here right here um, Corky was so startled so there may be maybe a small discussion of assault there so coming down here assault of Corky and then homicide of Corky. We're running right through the whole whole template there, and then um, I'll see, making sure to run through all of it though. Intent um, to serious bodily intent to cause serious bodily harm, murder. I don't see that there. But maybe depraved heart, and then make sure to throw in uh, degrees. After degrees, then we're going to oh, miss prison. That is a very good argument as well. Make sure to throw that in. Miss prison or crime prevention. Excellent argument. Degrees. The the defenses. Make sure that. If there are any de any defenses, I don't see that here. That well, let's see. I'm gonna hold hold off on that for a minute. Then we got um, I don't see, I don't well maybe was there a voluntary manslaughter? M well, I'll tell it then involuntary, which is most likely gonna gonna be. Okay, and then um, I think I think that's it. Okay, okay, and then um, they come down here and we miss prison crime prevention. Though in a conclusion, and then crimes under uh, crimes under defense of Corky. This is where now was Corky didn't cause any particular murders or homicides. We talked about the, the structure crime, the burglary. And then, oh, we want to make sure too that, see, ransacking, I would say that we have at least a larceny at that point. This, I'll point this out in terms of facts. Ransacking the house right here, right up here. The facts point this out that, uh, ransacking the house right there okay point that out and then oh right right exactly exactly it isn't it isn't a very good very good point on that it isn't it isn't larceny it's criminal um, Malicious mischief. That's what it is. Hopefully I'm... Oh, I spelled that. Okay. Okay. And then down down here, uh, I think that's... We don't have any theft crimes. I mean, let me try to take, to take a, another look, peek up here. Um... Flat out the back door, nothing 
well, nothing was actually taken, but it, had there been something taken, there were, there possibly could have, could have, could have been a larceny at that point, had there been something taken. We're not, we're not really sure. And then make sure to throw in a conclusion at this point. Oh, also, we want to, we want to make sure too, right after the conspiracy, we throw in accomplice liability. Okay, I think think we have have that here. Oh, wait a minute here. You know, I want to see see about something here because when we're talking about oh yeah, we're talking about the attempted attempted larceny. Ah, that's what it is. Ah, okay. And the defense would be uh, legal or sorry, factual impossibility. Okay, which is not a, a defense. Okay, and uh, I think I think that's that's good. And we'll call call this one um, concluded. Oh, let's see. I'll bring this up here. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Okay, we'll call that concluded, and we'll come down here and start our second. Second question. Excellent. All righty. Now, question number five. Um, GBX to July 2019. As with all essay questions, let's begin with the call of the question. What contract rights and remedies, if any, do each of the following parties have against Sam's estate? One, Bob discussed. Two, Charlie discussed. Three, Art discussed. Now, contract rights and remedies. Ah, should I, should cue us right there to the area of law? Contract law. Okay, good. Okay, let's throw down our quick shopping list here. Or I should say, let's start addressing our, our uh, question as well. Uh, Bob's contract rights and remedies? Question mark. Two, Charlie's contract rights and remedies. Question mark and three arts contract rights and remedies. Okay. Question mark. Okay. Okay. Throw down our shopping list because we now we know our area of law. Contract formation. Third party rights. Covenants, conditions, excuses, discharge duty to perform, breach of contract, and remedies. Okay, let's go up and read our question now. Sam owned a classic 1965 Aris automobile. Only 500 such cars were made, and they are considered highly valuable. Uh, Sam, and Art, a, Sam and Art, a classic car specialist, signed a valid written contract. Now, we know, we know that there's a valid written contract between Sam and Art here at this point. So we've got to come down here concerning Art. But we don't know exactly what the area of law is yet. So let's see what, what that says up here. Now, the contract stated in its entirety, Art will serve as Sam's exclusive agent in selling his, his classic, or his heiress car. Upon successful sale, Art will earn a commission, I have to point this out, commission equal to 10% of the sale price. Okay, so looks to me like we have a common law services contract. Okay, down here in a written, uh, written content, we want to make sure to point out mutual assent, consideration, and that and that there's no statute of frauds defense applicable here, which I don't see that because it is a validly written contract. Okay, now a few days later, Sam showed his heiress to Bob who had learned of the car when he saw a for sale sign. Okay, now write down under Bob now. Let's 
applicable law, common law, services, make sure we're now contract formation. This is where we talk offer ever and under offer advertisement pops up immediately, which generally is not considered an, a valid offer. Um, okay, that, that would be connected to the, to the for sale sign. Uh, the for sale sign that Sam had decided to place on it while, park, par, uh, while it parked uh, in his driveway. Bob, wanting to add the heiress to his personal collection, mailed Sam a sign letter. Okay, that, that day offering to pay $250,000 for the car. Right there, there's your offer. And there's, okay, so we got intent to be bound. You have uh, certain and definite terms. We got communication to offeree. Okay, so we have, we have but remember the offer is coming from Bob at this point. I wanna put a, put a note up here to us. Offer from Bob. Okay. Okay. So now, so here's sign a signed letter that day. Okay. Offering to, offering to pay. There it is. For the car. Okay. When Sam received the letter, he telephoned Bob and said he accepted the offer. Now here's the interesting aspect. Under acceptance. We have an interesting aspect here of the mirror image rule. Now, remember the offeror is master of the offer. Now, in this aspect, if if it was it is um, the argument can be made is telephone a telephone acceptance the same or reasonably the same as a um, as a written letter offer. It's, you know, it's arguable. It could be considered that it's reasonable. So we want to make sure to point that out, that there was um, unequivocal assent. And, but remember that we're pointing out that we talked about the method of acceptance is the, the discussable point here. Okay, now down here, Telephone Bob and said that he accepted the offer. Now, they agreed to meet the following week for payment and exchange of title. Um, Sam, okay, what am I going to point out too after, after we have the acceptance here? Consideration, okay, and then statute of frauds, argument, sale of goods, $500 or more. Remember, they, yeah, the argument as to whether or not it was in writing. But remember the the um, the agreement to meet. Let's see. Do, do, um, yeah, the argument could be made that the statute of frauds may may bar enforcement. We'll, we'll hold off on that discussion here for a minute. But the writing, the the argument could be made that the writing that that um, was contained in the in the signed letter may suffice for the writing. Wow, well, that, that might, might be a, um, a workaround argument. Okay, now, they agreed to meet the following week for payment and exchange of title. Now, Sam then called Art and said he was, he was terminating their agreement. We've got to ask ourselves here, has, has now, can, can Sam, right here, up here under this paragraph here, can Sam just call back and terminate the offer? Well, he called Art and said he was okay, terminating their their agreement. So at this point, that would be considered a revocation. Is is the offer irrevocable? Let's see here. Um It's not an option. See, we're running through it. We don't have an option contract. It's not a unilateral contract once performance has begun. Is, was there any detrimental reliance? Well, 
the argument made, it's a, it's a very small argument here, that they, they agreed to the following week for payment in exchange of title, but that's not, not necessarily enough. So the argument maybe could be made that, that the, the uh, Bob and Sam contract at this point was, was, was um, terminated. Well, the other thing too, we wish probably read, read the rest of this as well. So I'll just put this down down here. Okay. Okay, right here. The next day, Charlie saw an advertisement for Sam's heiress in a classic car trade publication. Okay, down here, we have very similar applicable law. Common law services contract formation offer and this would be the advertisement aspect. Okay. Then Art had placed the uh, ad prior to Sam terminating their agreement. Let's see what was it here. Um, wait, oh, wait a minute. I, you know what? I, I think I read this wrong. Thank you so much for your patience with me. Now, Sam showed his. Okay, I, no, I was right. I was right. Thank you for your patience. Uh, the next day, Charlie saw an advertisement for Sam's heiress in a classic car trade publication. Art had placed the art had placed the ad prior to Sam terminating their agreement. Okay, right here. This is an important one. So art right here Oh, I you know what? <laughs> All this up here I need to copy and paste this down below. Thank you for your patience. Oh. There we go. Put this put this under number two here. There we go. And then now underneath art we have Detrimental reliance, which is the placing of the placing of the ad. In the trade magazine. Okay. There it is. Okay, up here now. Thank you so much for your patience. Okay, now, next day, Charlie saw an advertisement for Sam's heiress in a classic car trade publication where I talked about that advertisement, offer advertisement. Art had placed the ad prior to Sam terminating their agreement. Okay, so there was a termination by Sam. We'll talk about rev revocation here. Let's see here, right there. Okay. Now, Charlie drove to Sam's house and offered three hundred thousand dollars for the car, and said he would mail a written contract. Okay, so we got off, we got the face-to-face -face negotiation for Charlie and Sam. Right here, up here to Charlie. And communication.
Here's the problem with the the face-to-face -face communication though. Was there an acceptance communicated by Sam? Here it is right up here. Right here it said um, Sam, Charlie drove to Sam's house and offered the $300,000 which we were noting for the car and said he would mail a written contract to Sam then that next day. Sam said he would think about it. Okay. We the acceptance what was what would thinking about it mean? Well, see this is this is the aspect it's not it's not in the of mirror image. Okay. And then, okay, and then, let's see, I'm trying to think. Okay, I, th I, th I think that's good there. Okay, now, he did not inform Charlie of his, of his agreement with Bob. Okay. Okay, um, interesting aspect there. Okay, we'll have to make sure to keep that in mind. I'm, I'm thinking that's more of a revocation argument. Question mark up here he did okay um, when Charlie's contract arrived ah there it is ah maybe mailbox maybe maybe mail, the mailbox rule might might kick in at this point question mark uh, and offered three hundred thousand for the car. I said he would mail a contract, a written contract, to Sam that day. Sam said he would think about it. He did not inform Charlie of his agreement with Bob. When Charlie's contract arrived, Sam signed it, placed it in a stamped ah, placed it at there it is, stamped envelope addressed to Charlie, and dropped it in the mailbox. There we go. Letter sent to Charlie. Remember, it's a if, if acceptance is effective upon proper dispatch. Remember the thing about there already being um, an offer to uh, Bob. I want to make sure to point this out here that possible indirect revocation if. Charlie finds out that that uh, Sam has indeed already already sold sold the car to to Bob. Then now Sam died in his sleep that night. Now this down here, this is why I brought this up for um, under art. Not only is there a detriment of reliance at this point, but we have a termination, which through uh, death death of a contracting party. Okay. Let's see. Make sure to copy and paste this. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Now, Ned wants to keep. Now, he, his will left all his property to his only relative, a nephew named Ned. Ned wants to keep the heiress. As a result, Bob and Charlie filed timely claims against Sam's estate seeking title to the car. Art filed a timely claim seeking a, seeking um, ten thousand dollar ten thousand percent. Excuse me of, of the sales commission, which would be depending on which which contract actually goes through here. You could have um, twenty-five thousand, thirty thousand. So, let's see here. We're taking a look. Okay, first of all, going through the Bob contract, was that was there? A, there wasn't an, an acceptance up here under the Bob contract. Signed a letter that day. Okay. When Sam received the letter, he telephoned Bob and said he accepted the offer. 
They agreed to meet the following week for the payment exchange of title. Sam then called Art and said he was terminating their agreement. There's your revocation. Can it, we have already have mutual assent consideration? Make sure to point this out here. Yeah, because consideration. Um, but was there an actual writing between the between the parties? And that that's that's the discuss discussable point here, because it was the telephone conversation, uh, which um, see Bob signed signed the, the letter that he mailed, but Sam re, um, Sam re, Sam accepted over the telephone. So the argument can be made that maybe the statute of frauds bars enforcement. It's it's a possible argument. Now the other one now underneath here, under Charlie, this is where um, Charlie's responding to Sam to Sam's uh, well the advertisement left by by Sam through Art in the trade the trade magazine or trade trade publication. Then uh, Charlie drives to Sam's house and offered 300 for the car and said he would he would mail a written contract to Sam that day. Now, Sam said he would think about it. At that point, has has the offer actually taken place? And in the in the face to face negotiation aspect, no, because after the, after they part company, the offer technically evaporates at that point. Now, he did not inform Charlie of his agreement with Bob. Now, when Char when Charlie's contract arrived, that this is the aspect. This is actually offer number. You can see this as offer number two, right here. Um, yeah, see there was there was an ex another offer through. This would be through um, through the mailed letter from Charlie, and then the mailbox rule. Might might pr provide that uh, acceptance because when when uh, Sam received Charlie's letter, Sam signed it, placed it in the stamped envelope, addressed it to Charlie, and dropped it in the in the uh, in the mailbox. So at that point, the, there would be acceptance via the mailbox rule, and this is before Sam Sam died in his sleep that that night. So the argument could be made. That the strongest argument here is actually for Sam, and therefore the 10% sales commission would be to the $300,000. So coming down here, breach of contract, and then remedies. This would be for expectation. Number two, I want to make sure to mitigate damages. Expectation, uh, consequential, and incidental. Okay, now underneath the expectation, this would be the 10% 10, 10%. Let's see here. Uh, okay. Of the char, I believe it would be the Charlie contract, which would be for the three hundred thousand. Okay. Oh. Okay. And under here, so we're looking at basically which which would equal thirty thousand. Conclusion. Okay. Make sure to point it point out a conclusion up here as well. Okay. I think that's that's a um, a good faith effort at answering this this question here. Okay. I want to put a shout out to Chess Cruncher TV. Keep chess crunching, chess cruncher. And I also want to put a shout out to my Amazon Kindle book, Battling a Big Bad Baby Bar, Essay Basics. Thank you for tuning in, and God bless.